Hello and welcome to our audience members joining us from across the globe. I'm Raymond Kerr. I'm the Chief Program and Development Officer here at the Arab Gulf States Institute. I'm delighted to welcome you all to today's program titled, Is a U.S. Broker a Deal Between Israel and Saudi Arabia Possible? We have over 300 registered attendees today, uh, a real testament to the wide interest in today's topic. Uh, we're also very pleased to be hosting this webinar in partnership with ROPES, the Regional Organization for Peace, Economics, and Security. And I will introduce their executive director, Zenia Svetlova, who is moderating the session today. Uh, Zenia is, of course, the executive director of ROPES. Uh, previously, she served as a member of the Israeli Knesset from 2015 to 2019. She is also a policy fellow at the Midvim Institute for Regional Foreign Policy and a fellow at the Institute for Policy and Strategy at Reichman University. An expert on Middle Eastern and Russian affairs, she has written for newspapers and other media outlets, including the Jerusalem Post, Haaretz, and the BBC Russian Service. Uh, and with that, Xenia, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Raymond. We are so very happy uh, to be partnering with the Arab Gulf State Institute in Washington uh, in this very special webinar, which I think that uh, we can all agree that this is indeed uh, the talk of the day in many capitals, not only in the Middle East, but also across the world globally. It's uh, something that preoccupies many policymakers and decision makers uh, and uh, people who are interested in the Middle East and would want this region to succeed and uh, move forward uh, toward the more harmonious uh, relations between its uh, uh, members. Uh, so uh, we will be discussing today uh, the change in the uh, regional architecture, security and diplomacy, uh, things that happened just very recently or the rapprochement uh, between uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran. Uh, and of course, the possible, uh, the very much discussed uh, deal between uh, Israel and uh, Saudi Arabia with the help of, of Washington, uh, the United States, uh, its probability, uh, its challenges uh, and uh, the possible uh, uh, benefits uh, to every possible side uh, out of this free, but also to the Palestinians uh, who are not uh, perhaps being actively mentioned uh, as a part of the deal, but uh, we believe that they're very much so. A few words about ROPES. So uh, for us, uh, the Regional Organization for Peace, Economic and Security, we are working since 2020 uh, to leverage the Abraham Accords to introduce the trilateral partnerships between Israel Palestinians and the region, the Middle Eastern region, in areas such as education, environment, media, uh, in order to rebuild uh, a long-term momentum towards a conflict-ending Middle East uh, agreement. Uh, among our activities are leadership summits for young men leaders. Uh, we bring regional emerging leaders on the uh, dual narrative tours of Israel and Palestine. Uh, we run education exchange programs from students uh, from across uh, the region. And then we do the same for the journalists uh, with our special program uh, taking place in Bahrain uh, just uh, uh, this November. Uh, our alumni include diplomats, members of parliament, venture capitalists, entrepreneurs, journalists, and peacemakers. Uh, we believe that this future generation uh, will be much better connected, will intimately know each other, and will be able to take charge in their hands in order to build a better future for everyone here in the Middle East. You are welcome to visit our website, ropes.org, or follow us in the special media uh, and to tune to our new podcast, The Ropecast, on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or your other favorite platform. So let me introduce the three amazing uh, panelists uh, that we have uh, here with us uh, today. Uh, uh, thank you very much, first of all, for joining us. Uh, we have here Hussein Ibish, uh, a senior resident scholar at the Arab Gulf State Institute in Washington. He is a weekly columnist for the National, uh, the Emirati newspaper, uh, former columnist for Bloomberg, a regular contributor to the New York Times and the Daily Beast, a frequent contributor to many other US and Middle Eastern publications. Uh, he has made thousands of radio and television appearances and was a Washington DC correspondent for the Daily Star. Uh, many of uh, Hussein's articles are, are archived at his uh, we website, Ibish Blog. Uh, thank you very much, Hussein. Uh, the next uh, is uh, Dr. Nir Bombs, uh, a research fellow at Moshe Dayan Center at Tel Aviv University and at the International Center for Counterterrorism at Herzliya, the Reichman University. He is a member of the board of the Institute for Monitoring Peace and Cultural Tolerance in School Education and co-founder of cyberdissidents.org 
network of bloggers from across the Middle East that focuses on freedom of expression and promotion of dialogue uh, in MENA region. Prior to his return to Israel in 2004, Nir served as a vice president of the Washington-based Foundation for a Defense of Democracies. And last but not the least, uh, Aziz Al-Gashian, a Saudi fellow with the sectarianism and desectarianization project, SEPAD, whose research focuses on Saudi-Israeli relations and Saudi foreign policy. Aziz earned a PhD on Saudi-Israeli relations from the University of Essex, where he then taught Middle Eastern studies, international relations, and polit political theory. He has appeared on many news outlets, such as BBC, France 24, uh, Force TV, ABC Australia, and TRT World. So dear friends, thank you very much uh, for being here. We have an excellent panel and we have a lot uh, to uh, discuss uh, in, uh, uh, in this. And uh, first of all, I would like to forward an open question to all panelists. We will then go to a, a moderated discussion. And uh, I encourage, of course, uh, all our attendees to send us questions in the Q&A section or in the chat box. Uh, I will be gathering the questions and after the moderated discussion, we'll go straight to your questions. But first of all, I'm using my prerogative as a moderator to open the uh, floor uh, with this question. Why is Israeli-Saudi peace or normalization, depends on who you ask, is so important and vital uh, to our region uh, and perhaps also to global security? There are no hostilities currently. We are being told that there is a growing clandestine cooperation that goes on for years. So what will change tomorrow if these two countries will sign a normalization agreement? Hussein, I would like to start with you, please. Okay, uh, a very quick tour d'horizon of the three parties involved, because what we're talking about here is a triangular agreement um, between Israel, the United States, and Saudi Arabia, all three of which are necessary. You couldn't really do a successful bilateral between any of the two parties, uh, except maybe Israel and the United States, and I'm not sure what more there is to secure in that relationship. It has to be triangular to hold together, and I'll explain why. For Israel, it's straightforward. Uh, the uh, you know the, this would be um, along with UN membership back in the 40s and the uh, peace treaty with Egypt, which basically took wars between Israel and Arab states off the table as a plausible uh, scenario. Um, this would be the the one of the three biggest um, diplomatic breakthrough in the country's history, I think. It would open the door for um, almost any other uh, Sunni majority, Sunni Muslim majority state in the world to go ahead with uh, diplomacy and commerce with Israel if they wanted to do that. And I think eventually almost all of them would. Um, you know, it would leave um, a hostility to Israel sort of marginalized uh, to Iran's network of, of armed gangs and uh, the extremist terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda and Daesh and what have you. And those, again, they're mutual enemies between Israel and Saudi Arabia, which is another of the benefits for uh, both of those two countries. I think Saudi Arabia really would be looking for what it can get from Washington. Uh, clearly looking above all for a formalized security agreement with the United States, right? It's not satisfied with what exists. What exists now is the Carter Doctrine, uh, which is um, well, 60 years old almost, and it doesn't correspond to the threats that exist in the middle, you know, in the in the third decade, uh, you know, or this, you know, halfway through the second decade of the 21st century, the, the threats are very different. So I think it's that's really what the Saudis are fishing for above all, and um, that's crucial for them. The most interesting question is what's in it for the United States? And there I think you have to look at, um, especially post the invasion of Ukraine, the growing centrality of security control and security coordination in the three waterways and three main choke points around the Arabian Peninsula, right? The, the Red Sea, the Arabian Sea, and the Persian slash Arabian Gulf. And the choke points are the uh, Suez Canal, uh, Bab al Mandeb, and the Strait of Hormuz. If Israel and Saudi Arabia normalized and entered into a, an open strategic partnership, you could get 
these American allies uh, or partners together increasingly in an interlocking network of security cooperation, um, Israel, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Bahrain, in maybe Qatar, maybe not, maybe Kuwait, maybe not, but definitely Egypt and Jordan. Now look at that. Look at that list of countries and conceptualize how it forms an enveloping uh, you know, ring around the Arabian Peninsula. And, and this is the great trump card for the United States. When it comes to great power competition with China, uh, the amount of trade that goes through those choke points and those waterways is incredible. And the extent to which, for example, China gets its energy through those choke points and exports its manufactured goods back out to the world through those choke points is overwhelming. This does cause a lack of sleep in Beijing. And I think the United States is looking to lock in that competitive advantage for one or two generations into the future. And this long shot is the way to do that for them now. Thank you very much, Hussein. And you mentioned the defense treaty. Uh, it would be interesting to see if uh, the Saudis get their defense treaty, whether Israel would be pushing much harder to get uh, one of these uh, by itself. Uh, this is something that uh, doesn't specifically relate to our topic today, but still something to consider. Uh, Aziz, I would like to go to you uh, with the same question uh, from the Saudi perspective. And uh, I mean also internally, uh, why is it important? Is it important? Is it presented as something that is absolutely crucial, uh, and uh, uh, what do Saudis think about it? Well, first, I just want to thank you, thank you all for inviting me, and, and it's great to join this uh, very illustrious panel. Um, I, I think to just answer this question very briefly, <clears throat> when it comes to perhaps the region, why Saudi Arabia and Israeli normalization will be good, it will have to, in my opinion, depend on the sequence and perhaps the DNA of this relationship in itself. Uh, what would come with this relationship? What did this relationship entail? Uh, what kind of changes on the ground? And I do think, it, particularly, I think I, I am speaking about the Palestinian issue. And I think if this is a, if if this is done right and kind of leveraged and used uh, in a very positive and constructive way to at least alleviate these the 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 problems that take place in the Palestinian Israeli dynamic then I think this is this is a, something that's really worth <clears throat> going for um, and I, and that's why I think Saudi here is, is a point of leverage how can we how can this leverage be used to change something on the ground in that sphere I think when it comes to Saudi Arabia domestically I'll be very honest I do think Saudi Arabia Saudi ruling elite, other elites also do see strategic utility in Israel. In my opinion, and I say this with respect, I don't see Saudi Arabia, I don't think that Saudi Arabia sees enough strategic utility in Israel to warrant at least a peace for peace paradigm. That something that is just out of the uh, aspect of a Palestinian issue that they require in order to legitimize this relationship. In addition to or hence why there is these demands from the United States. I think, in my opinion, it realized that um, in the way Saudi Arabia is dealing with some of its um, some of its regional affairs, a normalization with Israel can perhaps hinder and exasperate some of these security aspects if it is done incorrectly. Hence why there is the demands, as I said, from the United States, which kind of begins to now match what the price is of Saudi-Israeli normalization for Saudi Arabia. And I think that's why we're going to see, you know, it's it's what are the outcomes of the relationship rather than um, what this relationship will bring. I don't think it will be any surprise that they're both very complementary economies. I don't think it will be very surprised that there's a lot of uh, uh, tech that uh, Saudi and others can use. But, you know, there is a risk here that if it's done incorrectly, uh, there, you know, that this may backfire. And I think this is precisely why Saudi is becoming very careful with this. 
and also added that layer of demands from the United States. So that's how I how I see things uh, from the Saudi perspective. Thank you very much, uh, Aziz. Uh, and uh, now to my friend Nir. Uh, Nir, perhaps uh, you can also uh, illuminate us about not only the strategic interests uh, of Israel uh, in such a deal with Saudi Arabia, uh, but also in the domestic political sphere, which is boiling uh, uh, today more than ever. Uh, how is it being um, how is being seen by various parties? Uh, and uh, we do hear uh, a rare unity of voices from the coalition and opposition that, yes, basically it's a tremendous deal. It will uh, change uh, life here in Israel, but there are also some uh, voice of dissent. Uh, can you please speak about it? Well, I think Hussein uh, was actually very clear in speaking about the Israeli interests. And in that sense, if you would ask both sides of the political aisle, they will say that's probably a very good idea. But if they will debate something, it's going to be really about the price. Uh, what does Israel need to give, particularly when it comes to the Palestinian issue? And perhaps we'll speak about that uh, in uh, in a few minutes. But I mean, broadly, uh, it's going to be difficult to find significant voices in Israel who would think that the idea of normalization is not a good idea. And perhaps in this context, allow me perhaps uh, uh, to just add something on, well, perhaps the, the etymology. I mean, lots of headlines about normalization and, and, and why is this important overall? Uh, and perhaps, the first few decades after Israel uh, was uh, established and perhaps until the first uh, glass ceiling was broken in Egypt in 1977 and the peace agreement in 1978, uh, we, Israel was created uh, despite the will of its neighbors. Saudi Arabia voted against um, and supported uh, the Israel's rivals in the war of independence. And we've had uh, seven different countries sending uh, forces uh, and then later on, Israel had been struggling for its existence. And I think the term normalization came with this idea that if the normal, the old normal was that Israel needs to exist despite the will of its neighbors and with uh, animosity and, and conflict, perhaps the new normal, the normalization we seek to create uh, is to have Israel as a neighbor in the Middle East. Uh, if a plane needs to fly above another part of the region in order to get somewhere, then that's normal. We, this is something we can do. And if at some point we need to move uh, merchandise um, and we can take a, a, a train uh, and put it through Saudi Arabia and Jordan and Israel and go to the Mediterranean uh, in order to uh, save uh, 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 significant time in trying to take a ship uh, and sail across the world. And that's probably something normal because there are interests in doing it. And therefore, uh, the interests are very, very clear. Uh, and the main question here domestically is, uh, particularly when it comes to this government that is very busy uh, with domestic uh, concerns and, and again for a different uh, webinar, but uh, this is not the easiest of times in Israel. But the question is whether this government can actually deliver something, uh, because it seems that uh, the Saudis uh, are, are not uh, uh, just willing to just give a gift uh, uh, to Israel without asking for some uh, progress. Um, and of course, there are some people here uh, who are on one side of the political aisle who says, like, this is actually an opportunity. Perhaps this is an opportunity to bring uh, also the Palestinians into the broader orbit of normalization and regionalization, uh, and the orbit that began with the Abraham Accords, and others who would say, well, you know, we're not willing to give anything. Um, that's going to create an internal political crisis. And sometimes, you know, all politics is domestic. Before we go to further questions, Nira, I just uh, want to follow up uh, on what you just said uh, domestically, and please answer very briefly. Uh, could, you know, potentially the deal with Saudi Arabia elevate the position of the current government uh, and uh, perhaps uh, save it from itself uh, even? Certainly, uh, the, the, since there is a consensus uh, when it comes to uh, this type of a move, if Prime Minister Netanyahu, again, under this current crisis, is able to uh, reach this type of uh, a move, even at, the, at a certain price, it may create some internal dynamic that uh, potentially can provide a ladder to uh, either move, shift things away, or even potentially doing something politically. Um, again, there are a number of scenarios that one can uh, paint, uh, but uh, the political situation often 
uh, domestically is, has stronger dynamics and it's not always clear whether something that comes from the outside uh, will be able to provide that letter or whether Netanyahu's rivals will be willing to give him a hand um, and not say, well, you know, uh, let's wait for you to fall and then we will do it. Thank you, Nir. Before I go to you, Aziz, I would just like to remind to our audience uh, that you are welcome to send your questions in the q and I already see some of the questions here. Uh, and I will also try, even before we go to the Q&A session, uh, to uh, uh, involve some of them, you know, and uh, uh, post them to our speakers. Uh, so uh, please uh, do that. I'm absolutely sure that uh, there are many uh, things that you would like to ask our panelists. So uh, Aziz, um, you know, I would like, I was thinking about it, and it seems that it's been an overwhelming change in the region, in the regional uh, security and the diplomatic, uh, mainly architecture, uh, in the recent year, because we see how Saudi Arabia had normalized uh, relations with Iran, a major development that had also sent a shockwave uh, to Israel, and earlier also with Turkey. Uh, we can compare how the situation looked like uh, for Saudi Arabia, for example, five, six years ago, and how does it look now? Bashar Assad was readmitted to their Arab uh, with the Saudi consent. Is this a Saudi version of uh, zero problems with the neighbors uh, that we witness? Well, I mean, that's a good question. And, and I just wanted to echo what both Hussein and, and Nair said before. I mean, it, it speaks to the complexity of what we're, we're actually seeing here. There's a lot of domestic politics, domestic perception is also very important. So, you know, I just wanted to echo what both gentlemen said. Uh, when it comes to the region, you see, in my opinion, I actually wrote, forgive me for for, for saying that I, I wrote a piece with AGISW, but, but I will say that I wrote a piece with AGISW about this very, very well, issue. Always, always say that. <laughs> always say that. Oh, say so there you go. Uh, so I, I said it, and, and I wrote it before, uh, and it was one of the, I, I, would, I won't say myths, but one of the misleading elements of the Gulf, Gulf Israeli discourse is that the centrality of Iran, the fact that, you know, Israel and Saudi Arabia, the main thing that's really pushing for normalization is this idea of combating Iran. And for me, I found this very, very far-fetched. Um, this is not part of the Saudi logic. This may have been part of some others, other people in the region or other people in, maybe in Israel, but I think some in Israel also realize that this is, that this is just not the way Saudi functions. Um, and I think this really, uh, I would say, disrupted that momentum of trying to push for normalization in Israel. But in my opinion, I don't think it, it really gave a fundamental hit to that notion, to that push. Because I think what was for Saudi Arabia and Israel, the thing that's really pushing for normalization, the incentive for normalization for this bilateral cooperation uh, is really the economy and, and, and tech, it's, it's other things. And that's where Saudi Arabia is heading. So I think when it comes to the region uh, and addressing, uh, the, you know, the, the, for example, normalization with Iran, we're starting to see, of course, at, just to answer directly your, your point that Saudi is trying to achieve the zero conflict. It understands that this, you know, at the heart of this philosophy is its economic uh, principles and projects. It un whoever follows Saudi Arabia now um, understands or will immediately encounter Vision 2030 and the centrality of it in even the Saudi psyche, not just the Saudi society. And this is a process of trying to diversify economy and trying to make attract people to Saudi Arabia. And it, this is the thing that I think many people don't realize is that it, it knows that it cannot do this without a prosperous region. And that's why it's very much embedded in even the Saudi discourse and even the Crown Prince's discourse of that we always want to see a prosperous region. Now, the question is, how can we be escalate these tensions with Iran, and Yemen, and Lebanon, et cetera, in the region. And I think it's really to incentivize this and to flip the paradigm of rather than confrontation, it's actually incentivization. It's to saying, listen, that you may have a piece of this cake, part of the cake, and we could, we could then be part of this region where we could all not just be more prosperous together, but 
to be emancipated in some ways from the international uh, kind of um, pressures and the international whims of the political capitals elsewhere that, you know, through an establishment of prosperity, we're going to have a regional agency. So I think with this aspect here, indeed, it did change uh, the, the, I think it changed the, the logic of some people when it came to Saudi Israeli normalization. I think whoever is looking at Saudi Arabia now is starting to say, okay, no, uh, you know, this is part of the Saudi plan. Saudi Arabia did go through an experimental phase after the Arab Spring. This has to be mentioned that it felt that needed to be more assertive when actually traditionally it was something about more of a status quo. And I think what Saudi Arabia is doing now is creating a regional order and a regional kind of agency to, to say, okay, now let us address this issue. And in my opinion, let us address the issue of, of, of instability. And for me, per, and I just one, one more thing I'll say is that I think it's very fascinating to see implicitly the Saudi main threat. It's not necessarily a, a, a Shiite Iran. It's not a Muslim Brotherhood. While they, they are considered also threat, it's instability. And I think we're going to see Saudi Arabia dealing with the aspect of instability more pragmatically. So I think this is, you know, we're, we're seeing a new approach, a more careful approach uh, of Saudi uh, addressing its security concerns. Thank you very much, uh, Aziz. Uh, Nira, I would uh, like to continue with you and ask you uh, also about, uh, you know, the, the factor of instability uh, that is uh, to the, you know, detriment uh, of Israel is spreading uh, around its borders. Uh, and of course, Israel was always looking for, you know, to partner with strong countries. Uh, uh, also before the Camp David agreements, it was Iran and it was Turkey, of course, you know, and uh, then it was Egypt. And now one of these, uh, uh, stronger countries and stable countries, so of course, Saudi Arabia. But the question is, of course, the price. And then I will go to you, Hussein, with the same question. How far, and of course, you know, it's very difficult to predict anything, especially the future, but I'm still going to ask you, uh, how far the current Israeli government, which is by far the most far-right uh, government that we ever witnessed, is ready to go to secure this kind of deal? Or perhaps there are some kind of fantasies uh, that are still uh, uh, common there that uh, Israel would, uh, you know, that it brings to the table itself, it doesn't really need to pay a price, you know, that it's a, a worthy a bride, a bride that is worthy enough that it doesn't need to bring any dowry to, to that, to that wedding. Uh, what do you think? Hmm. Well, if you ask how far is this government willing to go when it comes to pay, paying a price on the Palestinian arena, I think the answer is not very far. Uh, and I'm not even sure if this is about how far the prime minister wishes to go. He may be willing to go further than some of its uh, partners, um, but it's gonna be very difficult uh, for this government to agree on some significant concessions. But the second question is, and I had a number of conversations about this uh, with uh, colleagues who are involved in this in, in, in different sides, um, including uh, on the American sides, we're working to sort of understand what progress can potentially happen uh, on the uh, on the Palestinian front. What is the price that's going to be needed? And I think here there's perhaps a degree of separation that we need to consider. Uh, and perhaps afterwards, my colleague Aziz may want to wish to comment on this. There are some things that the Saudis can gain that are related to the Palestinians, and some things that are less related to the Palestinians. And by this, I mean mainly Temple Mount. Uh, some of the some of the discourse revolves around uh, potential changes in the status quo regarding the Temple Mount. This is a significant statement. It has significant ramifications to the regional arena, to the Palestinians, to the Jordanians, but more so to the Saudis. Um, that's not necessarily bringing a Palestinian state closer. But if we're looking again broadly, there is a, a, an attempt, an access in the Gulf. Uh, that attempts to move the Palestinian file forward, understand, and we've heard about this as recently as today, that the Saudis uh, would like to further invest uh, in the Palestinian Authority. Uh, they have reinstated uh, the, uh, the ambassadorial position, um, uh, again, bringing the Jordanian ambassador uh, uh, to play a role and would like to engage. And part of that is an attempt to say, well, we're willing to engage with the PA, and perhaps this is a way to push things 
forward and to have more say in potential future leadership. I think there's some realization, uh, and I hope there is actually, that despite of the considerations that currently exist, um, look, Israel has a pretty good track record of changing government in the last few years. Uh, and uh, if you were to have a, a, an average between the Israeli elections and the Palestinian elections, you're probably going to find that, that we're in a good place in the middle. But there is a good chance that if we're starting a process now, uh, if it's serious, it may actually bring a, a political change in Israel. And at some point, uh, you know, there's going to be other parameters that can create a, a slightly better uh, uh, formulation that will enable a change to happen. And I think that there are some things that the Saudis can gain that will not necessarily uh, reflect directly on a Palestinian state. And if that's the case, then there's a, more of a chance that some of them can move um, because they're going to be less of an obstacle for this particular government. Thank you very much, Nir. Who could imagine that uh, uh, the Israelis, after five consecutive uh, election uh, rounds, uh, would be you know, wishing for another one to take place soon? Uh, but then again, you know, uh, you I'm not sure they're wishing, but they, this is just a statistical uh, prediction. Yes, well, a change in government doesn't them. necessarily require an election. It requires a new governing majority, a new yes. Knesset majority. So you, you could this do it. This is also very true. Yeah, you don't uh, have to have an election. And, and I think it's better not to put these kind of things uh, to a vote if you can avoid it, um, because then you're negotiating between... Uh, they're sort of you're adding another layer of negotiations to already complex negotiations, which is you know consulting a general public with with you know within a, a really complicated political system. Um, you want me to answer the same question on the Palestinians? Yeah, uh, Hussein, I would also yes, I uh, would I would like to ask you how far can Biden administration go in order to bring Netanyahu and Ben Salman to the uh, of the question. White House? And, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, it's uh, the question of the price. OK, the I, I mean, I, I think yeah. the Biden administration is serious, apparently, about uh, formal security understandings with Saudi Arabia. In other words, that Saudi, um, you know, demand request, uh, you know, ask is meeting with a serious response in the United States saying, yeah, you know, this can be really worth it for us and that they are convinced that they can sell it in the Senate if they get a good triangular deal. One of the reasons this has to be triangular is that uh, anything that gives the Saudis the kind of guarantees they're looking for in security almost certainly has to be confirmed by the Senate and or not at least not blocked by the senate that means that that you've got to have buy in from mainstream republicans and from uh most democrats and you would really want to avoid uh if you're the biden administration a revolt by prominent uh S senate democrat uh critics of saudi arabia like chris chase for example you would want to keep him on side not because his vote is so crucial. I mean, he could lose his vote uh, and the numbers could still work. But, uh, you know, if he's out there uh, condemning you uh, from a very loud perch, it, it becomes very awkward. So I, I think it is possible for the United States to do that. I also think there are interesting ideas floating around on how to square the circle on the nuclear issue and giving Saudi Arabia better access to more sophisticated weapons is something that's probably going to happen anyway. Um, so I don't think the bilaterals between um, Saudi Arabia and the U.S. are insurmountable at all. And the question is, what can the Biden administration do to convince Israel to incentivize Israel or uh, coerce Israel, <laughs> carrots and sticks, what can what do they have to help to make enough people in the Knesset um, interested in cooperating with Netanyahu to secure this major victory and to make Netanyahu interested in abandoning uh, the people he's been relying on for certain purposes regarding the judiciary that have a personal component for him, right? He, he's he got a, a legal case that is a criminal legal case that he's facing. It's not a non-issue. It's obviously significant. Um, so 
you know, they can, I think there's a limited amount they can do to coerce or incentivize Israel. I think if the if if um, Netanyahu and uh, the main body of Likud wants to dig their heels in and say, no, we are sticking with these smaller parties, with Smotrich, who says he's not going to give anything, with Ben Gvir, who doesn't want to give anything, with their parties, and we're not going to pick up the phone and talk with Mr. Gantz or anybody else about a new coalition. We're not doing it. Um, for both political and perhaps even personal reasons when it comes to the prime minister, then I think it becomes very hard for the United States because Israel questions regarding U.S.-Israel relations, for the most part, are as much domestic politics as they are foreign policy in the United States. When it comes to Israel's dealings with China, that's a different matter. When it comes to certain outlier issues, yes, the United, then it really is a foreign policy question and domestic politics gets shoved to the side. But on an issue like Israel's relations with the Palestinians or Israel's relations and interactions with Lebanon and Hezbollah, uh, these are not really foreign policy questions in the United States, or at least they are as much domestic politics questions. So it becomes very difficult, especially for a democratic administration. And I think now increasingly with evangelicals uh, for a Republican administration to openly put pressure on an Israeli government to do something they don't want to do. So that's very hard. Let me just add something on the Palestinians, if I might. Um, uh, that was actually my next question. So please, if you can hold this to the next yeah. round, yeah, that would be great. Yeah, okay. I will. Yeah. Yes. Uh, amazing. Uh, so uh, I'm going to go for the quick round between the, the three of our panelists. Uh, and uh, when I mean quick, it is quick. Uh, I used to be the, uh, at, at the Knesset and one of the committees, I used to count the time when people are speaking with a timer. So bear with me uh, on that. Uh, so because we want to go to the many questions but that we already have in our Q&A section uh, by our attendees. So a uh, question for Aziz. Um, for, from data that uh, has been published for the last couple of years by Washington Institute for Near East Studies, uh, we know that the support of Abraham Accord is actually dwindling in the Arab world. And this is including the Abraham Accord countries. Um, so uh, we saw, of course, uh, the Mondial, uh, and we witnessed just recently uh, the flare on the Libyan street after the meeting uh, between the Israeli uh, minister and the Libyan minister of foreign affairs. Uh, but at the same time, we also saw a plane, uh, uh, a plane of uh, Israeli tourists landing in the Jeddah uh, because uh, there was a failure, you know, in one of the systems, and they were welcomed, and the, everything went very smooth. What is the vibe on the Saudi Strip? Is there a generation gap, uh, also in regards to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Uh, so this is something that is uh, very good. I think it's very important to many Israelis this emotional dimension of agreement. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, it's a, it's a very good point, and it's and I have to say it's a it's a very elusive point because I don't think many people will know exactly how it is um, until they're they're on the ground and they're talking and they're listening. And for me, a part of me is surprised that it's the, those numbers that I, I'm familiar with that's coming out of the Washington Institute. Uh, those polls are not higher because I thought it would be higher given a very loud minority online, a very nationalistic kind of um, rhetoric that seemed to come out that, you know, that, that are very thin skinned when it comes to Saudi criticism. And a lot of the times they may give this impression that, okay, yeah, we're, we're, we're really liking Saudi Arabia, really liking Israel and we support Israel. But in fact, when we dig a little bit closer, this is not really, part of a change of perception towards Israel, this is more so of a change or, or a result of inter-Arab social rivalry uh, that has plagued our region for a very long time. So this is why sometimes, you know, it's, it gives the impression that, hey, there, there, there might be more of a rapprochement than there is. Uh, but secondly, I'm also surprised that, or I'm not surprised about those numbers because I personally became, you know, I realized how important it is in, when, in my own research. When I go talk to Saudis themselves, you know, it's very interesting is that Saudis don't, are not overly familiar 
with the dynamics of the Palestinian Israeli situation. Mm -hmm. But when they do, it's, it's actually very, it, it becomes very negative. So what this illustrates is that, you know, they know that Israel and Palestine, there's something negative. I don't know what it is, but I'm not, a, I'm just not a fan of it. And then when you, you know, this comes through conversation and, and, and I may be guilty of, of trying, you know, asking the questions, but I'm really trying to probe. So a lot of these questions and the, the perception of Israel depends on the framing of Israel. So when you look at, well, okay, what do you think about Israel, for example, and prosperity or, or addressing security issues in the region? You, you'll see a plausibility. You'll see, oh, okay, very, um, well, you know, I don't know, maybe, oh, okay. So it's very interesting. But then when you say, well, what about, for example, as uh, Nira alluded to, the notion of uh, Al-Aqsa, Al-Haram al-Sharif, then you start to see a different reaction. What? Al-Haram al-Sharif? No, 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 we're never going to accept that. So a lot of this depends on how it's being framed. And also just the third point that I would mention, you know, there, normalization as a perception has a, has a very steep hill to climb and to overcome. And the reason being is because how normalization, this is what I mentioned also in the nearest point earlier about the normal and, and the historic kind of aspect is that normalization is a very negative connotation now. And it's been used really as a charge. As that be, you know, mm -hmm. as a yeah. be, exactly. Yeah. It's used as a charge. It's used like we're not the normalizers. Yeah. yeah, you're the normalizers. No, Thank you're you actually the much, first Aziz. normalizers. So Thank you there's a much. lot of uphill. Yes, yes I'm we, sorry yes, to Mrs. cut you. I'm sorry Mrs. to cut you short, but we can do the whole webinar just on that. You know, so because this is the emotional component and the framing are so very much important. Uh, Hussein, uh, I'd like uh, to ask you about the. You know, uh, uh, for you know, Saudis, they are putting uh, some uh, Palestinian-related demands on the table. Yeah. Do we know what is there? What is in question? You know, because there are many yeah. speculations. Is Al-Aqsa, you know, for example, there is uh, turning some sea territories into B, no. for example? Yeah. Uh, yes. And so on. Yes. To the second one, no. To the first one, right. So, um, if you go back for the past three years, uh, both Israel and the United States, going back into the Trump administration have tried to dangle guardianship over the Muslim and possibly the Christian holy places in the Holy Basin uh, in Jerusalem, which, which are, according to the, the uh, Israeli-Jordanian peace treaty, uh, you know, is sort of right now recognized to be under the guardianship of Jordan. Uh, would the Saudis be interested in uh, accepting guardianship, a transfer? I don't know what that does to uh, Jordan and to the Israeli-Jordanian treaty. Um, I think it's a horrible idea. But the Saudis haven't been particularly interested in that. Um, they're much more interested in the security guarantees. They're more interested also in what can be done to bolster the PA. I, I think Israel has been very interested in selling that. And uh, the U.S. too... Um, I think it's a very bad idea, and I'm not sure if the Saudis uh, would would sort of take it as as something they could get, um, but it's not mainly what they want. Transferring more land uh, from a area uh, C that is populated by Palestinians into area B, uh, or even expanding slightly area A and the areas under full PA control, that is on the table for sure. Money is on the table for sure. Support for the PA, strengthening the PA in different ways is on the table for sure. The big question mark is about what will the Saudis ask of Israel regarding settlement expansion and guarantees about more annexation in the West Bank, the Jordan Valley, uh, Hebron, and other strategic areas, settlement expansion into E1 and so-called Harhoma and things like that. This is a very big question. This current Israeli government is not willing to talk about that stuff. I think Saudi Arabia does have some asks. And so the real question is, what are they? I don't know the answer, but I do know the trans, you know, making area B bigger is on the table, money is on the table, and I think Israel is continuing to try to sell the guardianship issue as a potential get. Uh, I'm not sure the Saudis are too interested in that. 
There you go. Then, uh, what about the Arab Peace Initiative? Is it still on the table? Yeah, I mean, it is and it isn't. Uh, let's put it this way. The Abraham Accord flipped the traditional understanding of the link between normalization and doing something about the, the occupation so much on its head, which is to say that the chronologically, the understanding built into the uh, initiative was that um, nor uh, uh, the occupation we dealt with first, and then normalization with the Arab League, and then even the, uh, the entire organization of Islamic cooperation, uh, which voted on this, uh, would come after. Now, what the Abraham Accords do, at least for the UAE and Bahrain, is they flip the the chronological logic and so you have normalization first and then maybe you do something on the occupation other than uh a five-year hiatus on annexation which was not really much um later now i i just think that uh, the you know the arab peace initiative becomes a way of selling this if you say this is proof of concept of the Arab Peace Initiative becomes a way of framing it, but it's really not the Arab Peace Initiative of 2002. You know, it's it's different. It, it it's something else. So uh, no, I don't. I think in all honesty, it's branding. It's become a marketing thing. It's not no longer really real. Branding is key. Uh, uh, here, uh, since Abraham Accords were mentioned, and I know that you do a lot of work, not only research but also work on the ground, connecting people taking them to amazing journeys uh, and so on. Uh, I would like to ask you about the convergence basically between these two uh, you know, terms, between these two ideas, the Abraham Accords and Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict and the peaceful resolution of it. Because we do see how time after time, uh, policy uh, uh, makers and uh, decision makers, you know, they try to separate, you know, this is different, this is different. And we don't like to basically talk about uh, what is common, uh, how, how, how we can combine between these two things. This is what we do a lot of, uh, of this uh, work also in ropes, trying to basically physically to connect the people from this, all of these uh, uh, places. Uh, but, uh, and we're talking interests. How can Palestinians benefit from this uh, uh, possible move, you know, in, uh, between Israelis uh, and Saudis? Well, I think one of the things that the Abraham Accords have helped do in the Middle East is to separate between the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the Israeli-Arab conflict. Two conflicts that perceived as one, but they were not one really. And part of what the Abraham Accords have helped do, but it, some of it of course have happened before, is showing that we need to make some progress in the Middle East. A part of that because we have some convergence of interests and, and uh, common threats, um, and we need to move forward. If the Palestinians are not able to move forward, it doesn't mean that we all need to stop. And therefore we can make some additional progress with the Israeli Arab circle with the hope that it will help the Israeli Palestinian circle. And some of the, the frameworks, uh, including I think the, uh, Abra, the Arab Peace Initiative uh, have actually alluded to this with the idea that you can actually can create a linkage and part of the interest for the Israeli part is to really sort the Israeli-Arab conflict. But when the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is stuck and it is stuck, then there is a realization that we need to move not from the inside out, but from the outside in. Uh, part of what had happened in the last three years uh, with the, the movement, uh, the opening of the people to people, including, by the way, this type of a conversation that I don't think could have happened when Israeli and a Saudi sit uh, together in a public uh, setting and speak about some of this. It means that we are now able to speak about these things more openly. We have many Palestinians uh, who are working with us on programs and on regional engagement. You would do the same thing in ropes. And I think these people broadly connect to this idea that we need uh, to move forward uh, in the Middle East and in the region as a whole. And part of it means that the Palestinian leadership and the Palestinian polity needs to move from like an axis of resistance to an axis of renaissance and to an axis of uh, acceptance that will enable us to move forward. Remember that if you're looking at broadly at the Palestinian-Israeli dynamic, and I think Hussein alluded some of the challenges, in order for something to move forward, we need to have a Palestinian polity. We need to have a Palestinian authority that's actually able to drive change. When the Palestinian authority is very weak, and it is very weak, even irrespective of Gaza and Hamas and the split, uh, one of the recent public opinion polls showed that uh, over 70% uh, of the Palestinians believe that uh, they need to rely on uh, militias 
uh, not controlled by the PA for just uh, uh, just to keep some degree of law and order. Of course, in a scenario like that, there's no even an agreement in reach. So only when there's a process of moderation and if the Saudis can potentially contribute to that. Uh, and the spirit is that we can actually need to work together against the uh, radical factions and, and move to a more pragmatic approach. Only then and only then we'll be able to begin to, to conceive an agreement. That's going to take some time. Um, and perhaps the opportunity now exists that we now have Saudi push uh, for this more pragmatic agenda, potentially Saudi influence. Again, it's very clear that uh, even when it comes to the Palestinian Authority, there's going to be a change of leadership in some foreseeable future. Um, and therefore, there may be new uh, opportunities and hopefully more pragmatic leadership, not just people, the one that Ksenia, you and I work with, but also leadership that will say it's about time for another move forward. Thank you very much, Nir. I liked very much the excess of Renaissance. I might steal this from you. Uh, and we are going now to the questions from our attendees. Uh, so I will address the questions to one of you. And I encourage, uh, you know, the other, you know, panelists, uh, of course, to, you know, if you have something to add, so please do it. Uh, but again, please be brief. We have a lot of questions. I want to uh, cover all of them, you know, before the end of the webinar. So let's start with Michael Harari. Uh, how much Saudi Arabia, and this is for you, Aziz, I think, how much Saudi Arabia believes that the present government in Israel uh, is a stable and credible partner? Does the latest Libyan-Israeli uh, episode influence the Saudi thinking, especially concerning the Palestinian aspect? Well, I, I, I just to be very quick, I don't think it seems it, uh, I don't think Saudi nor others uh, believe that it's a stable partner. In my opinion, I think one of the reasons why uh, there are these demands and conditions placed upon the United States is because I don't think it can depend on not only this government, but the political turbulence that does come from the Israeli uh, chain, constant elections. You know, uh, from the Abrahamic doves, uh, that was flying after the signatories of the Abraham Accords in 2020, uh, we saw Abrahamic fascists in Ben Gavir and, and, and Smodrich. And that constant change, and by the way, I take no glee in, in demonizing Israel, the, the, but this is just the reality. So I don't think that this will cause any, uh, is it, certainly not room for, it's not a beacon of, of, of confidence. Hence why there is going to be some demands that will, Oh, that will eclipse any kind of uh, something like what's going on now in Israel and, 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 and the nature of this political, uh, this, this coalition in Israel. Uh, anybody cares to add something to it? If no, then we'll go to the next question. And there are actually a few of them addressed uh, at the, our Israeli uh, panelists. Uh, so uh, Robert Friedman asks whether Netanyahu could overcome the opposition of Smotrich and Ben-Gvir to make significant concessions to the Palestinians, which we debated already, but still, it's a valid and important question. Aaron Poris asks, how do Israel's comments about the Israeli-Palestinian issue not being a focus and not necessary for normalization, impacting normalization? And uh, third one from Monica Marx. Uh, Israeli government figures have recently claimed Saudi Arabia is willing to normalize without any gains for Palestinians based only on deal making with the US. Is there some truth about it? So I would like to start with Nir, but I'm sure that uh, both Hussein and Aziz can contribute to that. Look, I think for, for, for Israel and for this particular government, it's certainly more convenient to say that we're able to move forward and just give lip service to uh, the Palestinians. Uh, there may be a degree of truth to this because in some time, in, at some point, uh, uh, Israel has is not given anything yet, and there's no specific, uh, you know, demands yet uh, on the table. But the proof is going to be in the pudding once we'll actually understand whether there are uh, specific conditions or uh, demands. At this point, it's, 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 it's really just a talking point. The same, you know, for the first uh, question. I mean, we can say, inshallah, if Britannia will be able to overcome. Uh, Smotrich and Ben-Gvir. I think Netanyahu uh, is stuck in a very uneasy political situation uh, where he needs to overcome uh, people very much to the right of him. It's perhaps uh, 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 one of the first times that Netanyahu has a, a configuration of a coalition um, where there are people so much to the right and there's almost nobody on the left. 
uh, off him and it's very difficult for him to uh, maneuver. Um, and then when it comes to, again, the question of uh, what Netanyahu uh, uh, can, can actually do, uh, there needs to be a particular configuration uh, of, of actual demands and things that are going to be on the table in order for a real position to emerge. I think at this point, there are lots of balloons uh, that are coming to uh, the air. I'm not sure that the Saudis, in a way, are that much in a hurry. Um, I'm not sure that this move needs to happen right now. Uh, I think some of it uh, perhaps is showing that uh, there is a direction that one can point to. Um, and then we need to find the particular political configurations and the partnerships also on the Israeli side. I think also the Saudis recognize that there are partners on the Israeli side that at this point are not in the government. Uh, and perhaps there's going to be another political configuration in where, uh, again, either the government will change and some of these other voices uh, uh, may make it easier. Uh, and last is that we have not yet heard much about uh, what should Israel role be or what Israel's responsibility will be in terms of concessions to the Palestinian side. It's very much sort of hearsay from the Temple Mount and all the way to area A, B and C. Um, it may not be ripe enough. Uh, uh, to actually be put on the table. The urgency, if I may just add something, I think mostly comes from Washington, uh, not from Riyadh, and certainly not from uh, West Jerusalem. It's it's coming from, from the U.S. Uh, the U.S. wants to, I think, lock in the strategic situation. I think it wants to stop any drift, further drift towards China, and uh, basically begin to secure its network of regional support and its security situation in the region, reassert its diplomatic dominance and stuff like that. It's it's an American-led initiative. The extent to which President Biden has bought into it as a viable project or not remains also uh, unclear, right? It may not be that the President of the United States is completely convinced that that this is going to work. But it's something his administration has been very aggressively uh, looking, trying to see if, if it's going to be possible or not in recent months. And, and uh, they're driving this. Uh, that's very clear. So, Hussein, uh, just a follow-up question, because it was also uh, directed at you uh, mm. from Mark Katz. Um, yeah. What do you see as the prospects for the American Congress and the American public to support a formal U.S. defense commitment to Saudi Arabia, and what yeah. kind of course, yeah, concessions well, stay in this support? Uh, there'll be there'll be significant and very vocal opposition from the uh, neo isolationist view, uh, forces on the MAGA right and on the progressive left. Um, you know, the MAGA right doesn't like any international engagement. The progressive left doesn't like Saudi Arabia and the Gulf countries much and uh, is increasingly skeptical of Israel as well. Uh, and uh, they they too have a kind of an isolationist bent. I think right now that's mainly shaping trade views when it comes to uh, the Biden administration. It hasn't it hasn't um, infected, if I may put it that way, uh, the the mainstream foreign policy security policies uh, of the Democratic Party, but but over time it could. but, that said, I think if you presented Congress, especially the Senate and the public, with a triangular agreement that involved Saudi Arabia's normalization with Israel, a, a three-way grand bargain with the United States, and a strong security uh, networking between the three parties, uh, I think it's it's not that hard to sell. In the Senate and in the United States, I think it would be warmly embraced. I think the hard sell here is in Israel, honestly. Thank you so much, Hussein. Aziz, two questions uh, are directed more or less uh, at you. One from an uh, anonymous attendee and another one from Mr. Ahmad El Sabag. Uh, so the first one, uh, why would Saudi Arabia value a U.S. defense treaty, given that under the U.S. Constitution and American law, no such treaty can offer anything other than a qualified assurance that in the event of a threat that the United States reserves the right to determine for itself how to respond. How does this tangible tangibly differ from the status quo? This is the first one. And the second one, it relates to the UAE and Bahrain uh, that could have not normalized without the 
Saudi pre-approval. Saudi officials still stress that their peace initiative and have long uh, vote not to normalize the expense of the two-state solution. Could Saudi Arabia at any time make a concession on its historical position if granted other wins in the future? The question is coming from Egypt. Okay, so that's, that, that, those are two questions. So the first thing is that, in, you know, the nature of these uh, demands, especially the um, uh, this um, NATO-like kind of relation, uh, demand that Saudi, condition that Saudi asked for, th there is one aspect here that I think is very much overlooked, in my opinion, and perhaps not paid enough attention, which is that, okay, Saudi made these requests, but it doesn't seem to be very much befitting with where Saudi Arabia is going. This means that Saudi Arabia will be part of uh, an American-led infrastructure in the region which it has implicitly suggested it wants to emancipate itself from. In addition, these things can be uh, in request from moving away from China. I don't see Saudi Arabia trying to move away from China. <clears throat> uh, I think there's, too much, there's been too much investment in there. Now, why were these demands mentioned? Allow me to be provocative and hopefully answer the question a little bit with a little bit of provocation. Saudi historically has always maintained a position, a distance with Israel, that it's not too far, but at the same time, it's not too close. It has always maintained this kind of very elusive, flexible relationship of always saying, listen, we are ready to normalize, but one, two, and three. Now, I think holding on just to the Arab Peace Initiative, that would have been too close, being too close to Israel because the nature of the landscape of the Air, uh, Abraham Accords changed the landscape and means it changed the interaction between Saudi Arabia and Israel. Israel is flying over um, Saudi airspace. There's a lot more, you know, as Mira said, interactions taking place. So these, the, these demands is perhaps designed, maybe has a little bit of intention of just giving that, that particular distance away from Israel, just a little bit. It may be to wait for another administration or to wait for a time that it believes it's right to make that move. So there is that element that it has to also think about. Um, there is that place that it's not too close, not too far. Now, when it comes to the Arab Peace Initiative and the UAE in Bahrain, I don't think the UAE asked permission or Saudi gave a green light to the UAE at all. I think the UAE did this very much by itself, unilaterally, you know, when it comes to the Arab. Uh, position. Hence why you see the Saudi response that came about six days later uh, about this and, and how they were going to respond. When it came, when it comes to Bahrain, Kingdom of Bahrain, it's also important to contextualize this from the Saudi perspective and who was in the White House. There was a time where we don't, we didn't know if the president was still going to continue for another four years or not. Now, at that time, Saudi had to make a position of saying, okay, it's not going to go against these normalization issues uh, between Saudi Arabia, between Bahrain and Israel, rather than promote the Arab Peace Initiative more. So it's more of a position of not being against the peace that was being pushed by Trump administration. And this was the balancing act that they were trying to play. Now, when it comes, just finally, when it comes to the Arab Peace Initiative, um, the Arab Peace Initiative, in my opinion, my belief, is a living peace initiative. It was firstly designed to have a cessation of hostility. It came, of course, at the backdrop of, of the Intifada. Then the subsequent years, especially after the Arab Spring, you see that the normalization or an Arab Peace Initiative was really a, a, a platform that could enable many ends in itself and it was therefore designed to be flexible and meaning. It's designed to be negotiative, but also, you know, that language is very implicit around it. So we have to look at the language around it. So, you know, what, what I'm seeing from these requests, demands, there's a Palestinian element into this, et cetera, is that we do have a, the spirit, elements, principles of the Arab Peace Initiative incorporated here. But I think if I could just put something forward here, you know, why can't there be a, a new paradigm rather than a land for peace paradigm, which is costly, politically costly, it requires a lot of political 
will, as we could see now, and not so much as a peace for peace paradigm that we've seen with the Abraham Accords, because then how can we leverage this? How about we have this concessions for peace paradigm? How about we kind of depoliticize this peace pr approach and then enable mutual gradual kind of uh, steps, um, uh, transactional steps to take place, allow there to be interactions officially, but to really channel it to the Palestinian, a Palestinian framework that could then help spill over this wealth into uh, governance, into infrastructure, et cetera. And I think if we, you know, we're, we're kind of stuck between two paradigms. Let us focus on a paradigm that gets the best out of both worlds. And that's the concessions for peace paradigm. And I think it's, we should, in so my I, opinion, I, we should that in fact is where That in fact is where this is going, because you can't yeah. get more than concessions uh, out of Israel under the most optimal circumstances. Yeah. Let me just say one thing. Move away from China doesn't mean undo any of the agreements. It doesn't mean stop uh, trading with Beijing or stop doing mutual cooperation on it. It means two things. Don't give Beijing any new undue strategic foothold in the region regarding military yeah. facilities, dual use facilities, Intel uh, ability signals, Intel. Don't make Huawei the center of your new telecommunication system. And in addition, don't trade in renminbi or yuan or anything other than dollars when it comes to selling large amounts of oil those are the kinds of strategic concessions that that are red lines for washington the stuff that was agreed upon uh first in when uh xi jinping visited saudi arabia large numbers of mous it was all okay with washington and then uh, the the uh, sino saudi trade conference with the 5 billion dollar thing you know, that's all okay Washington is not knows it can't stop Beijing from expanding its footprint in the in the Middle East and in the Gulf region. And it doesn't really want to do that. In addition, Washington was not too much disturbed, if at all, by the uh, by the uh, Chinese brokering of the of the diplomatic rapprochement with Iran, which which is I mean, it was just one of the many ups and downs of the Iranian uh, Saudi relationship for the past hundred years. They are constantly going back and forth. So the United States could not broker that. Iran does not talk directly to the United States. It was in the interests of the United States to have that done. The United States is an indirect minor beneficiary of this. And, uh, you know, they, the way they reacted, which was cautious, welcoming, with a kind of muted tones, I think was really uh, the genuine U.S. position. So it doesn't mean shunning Beijing. What it means is a firm commitment not to do those things that Saudi Arabia has been very careful not to do. Uh, and yet, in contrast with the UAE, which has been a little more, you know, as usual, uh, UAE is more agile, more flexible, more provocative. They always are because it's a small country without the kind of uh, commitments and leadership role that Saudi Arabia has. And it's just ultimately a bit less important and therefore it can pull you know, play some games without making people alarmed that Saudi Arabia can't do and doesn't do, and that's wise. Thank you very much, Hussein. And you also, uh, you know, uh, by the way, answered uh, one of the questions about the UAE role and its comparison also to Saudi Arabia. Nir, I want to uh, address this uh, next question to you. It's coming from Nigel Mayer, Jerusalem Central. Uh, if uh, Saudi Arabia were interested in some role at the Haram Sharif, how destabilizing could that be in Jordan? And what might be the consequences for the Hashemite kingdom? You, this is something that was widely discussed, uh, I remember, in the 2016, 2017. Uh, lately, we hear less about this. Uh, but uh, what do you think? What are your thoughts? Well, first of all, it was also discussed in 2006 by uh, Ehud Ulmert uh, as well. These are these who have been uh, floating around. One of the, uh, I think, reasons why uh, they were floated is that uh, the Jordanians have not been very proactive when it comes to the Temple Mount. And anyone who's been in the Temple Mount and had seen the core and state of affairs on the mountain uh, sees that A, there is not necessarily a guardian or responsible adult, and that Jordanians are de facto not really there. Something which is, by the way, very much seen uh, in times of uh, conflicts. And I think there's certainly some people 
uh, in Israel who would say that if there would be uh, another scenario when there is even the Jordanian, by the way, not to mention another observation force, Saudi uh, uh, in intervention, I think it's going to be much more difficult to see some of the scenes that we have seen in times of conflict on the Temple Mount, uh, including uh, bringing uh, cold and even sometimes warm, uh, you know, actual weapons, guns uh, that, that were brought inside and, and, and having all these acts of violence, uh, again, done usually by a small group of uh, of radicals, but still, it would have been much more difficult to do if there would have been a, a, a responsible adult. That's partially what prompts this. Uh, of course, this is also a very old historical rivalry uh, between uh, the two uh, families. We cannot uh, really go to that now, unfortunately. But uh, if you can please address the question of the consequences, you know. So it's uh, we see the now the you know it's very good relations between the Saudis and the Jordanians uh, who would want to jeopardize that. I'm not sure if anyone wants to jeopardize that. And I think there is some degree of responsibility here uh, when it comes to the uh, internal uh, Arab affairs. Uh, there may be a scenario in where uh, there could be a, a shared custodianship or some degree of uh, Saudi involvement that may even be accepted for the Jord Jordanians. And there may be that there's a, a, a way to bring the Jordanians in, in in some other ways. And the recent wedding between the two uh, families uh, may be a positive step for this. I don't think it has to be a zero-sum game. No, what you can do is you can bring Saudi money and authority into buttress Jordan's governorship, you know, so guardianship role, and you could find uh, a mutual support, but but an actual transferring of this, it also would violate the peace treaty with, between Israel and, and Jordan, and, uh, you know, it's a terrible idea from every possible angle, whereas creating a Saudi role, to strengthen the Jordanian position and uh, maybe make the adults in the room stronger and more authoritative, um, that's a very good thing. Agreed. Uh, a remark from a remark question uh, from a dear friend Nimrod Novik from Israel. Uh, if the uh, Abraham Accords decoupled from the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, uh, uh, how does one explain the Emirati refusal to receive Netanyahu and Abu Dhabi repeated delays at negative two, the sharper public and private criticism of Israel by signatories and other indications of uh, G2G slowdown. Yeah, let me explain this. Uh, it's a good question, Nimrod, but it's not as mysterious as you think. It doesn't decouple, right? There is no decoupling. What you end up with is, uh, from the UAE point of view, uh, a, a, a kind of more internationally normative approach to relations with Israel. It's similar to uh, the way in which uh, some European countries um, uh, relate to Israel, where they have trade and direct relations with the Israeli government and deal in a kind of normal way with Israel as another member state of the uh, UN. Uh, on the other hand, they reserve the right to object to the occupation. They reserve the right to hold specific uh, Israeli officials at arm's length because they can't stand what they've said and they find them very irresponsible. Uh, and to withhold um, diplomatic favors and, uh, you know, to register their... Uh, their extreme unease with certain Israeli behaviors in the occupied territories. And they've been doing that, and they're right to do it. And I think you can expect them to do more of it uh, insofar as they have a real interest in um, in protecting themselves and, and also in representing their views, especially when it comes to Jerusalem and the holy places there. So, I mean, for example, when uh, there was this confluence of protests you know, at Al-Aqsa and at Sheikh Jarrah over refugee issues. And all, the, Jerusalem became a very emotive, very potent issue, and it had uh, regional, diplomatic, and domestic political implications for UAE and, and Bahrain. They had to make their dissent very clear, and they had to make the point that they didn't like this very clear. The, the Abraham Accord does not uh, promise Israel uh, no criticism, and it doesn't promise Israel acceptance of the occupation. It's normalization in the manner uh, of uh, that a lot of European countries do without embracing the occupation and even uh, refusing to trade with settlement goods and things like that. So, you know, this is a normal international approach. You don't have to become the United States 
uh, if you've normalized with Israel and become the great friend and benefactor, you can have a normal relationship. And that, in fact, is what normalization means. And uh, dissent and registering your objections is normal. Can I just uh, mention something very quickly? Please, but very quickly, because we are... Yeah, very quickly. I just think what, what is it very interesting about the Abraham Accords, and I think what the UAE in particular has done is that it has deconstructed this whole relationship of Arab-Israeli relations. And is that basically this is not very much tied, so benefits between UAE and Israel, is not very much tied to things on the ground because it de already deconstructed it. And this is what really Anwar Gargash said. He said, well, this is a political problem, but the UAE, but you know, we still have economic issues that we could work on. So what this really does is that it's, it, it gives kind of a different uh, uh, dynamic to the relationship, which and enables UAE-Israeli bilateral relationship, relations yeah. to go. But there is also a limitation to this, that we probably can't depend on this too much in order as a framework to solve regional issues, because right. it just doesn't have that DNA. So because the very DNA of this relationship is different. It's very much bilateral. And this is also part of the whole legitimization process. The more they say no Netanyahu, no symbolic gestures, they're actually legitimizing this relationship and perpetuating economic relations. Yeah. So while it's very good for them bilaterally, as a, as a regional framework, it does have its limitations. And I hope we could spend more time later on in the future creates, to talk about this in the future. Yes, it creates it's definitely parallel the, tracks. That, that uh, yes, a lot of materials track. for the uh, yes. continuation of this uh, webinar. I just want to go now uh, for the last two questions that we have. Uh, again, very briefly, one of it uh, in regards to the difference uh, between the position of Mohammed bin Salman and his father, King Salman, in regards to the Palestinian issue. Uh, and Aziz, uh, the other one also uh, goes to you. And of course, everybody is welcome to add uh, to it. How would this agreement affect the recent improvement in Iranian-Saudi relations, given the, that one of Saudi Arabia's demands is to develop a civil nuclear program? Can I answer about, about the, the king and the son? But, uh, Aziz, I want to hear from you. But I just, I have a very, I've been thinking about this for a long time. Um, to me, it's 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 emblematic of a generational change. Uh, you know, when King Salman speaks of Israel, he speaks of it and apparently thinks of it in in the same generational terms that uh, Abu Mazin does, as a reality that has to be accommodated, as a fait accompli, as a fact of life. And uh, you know, it's not that. Um, it's still seen, uh, I think he still sees it as something artificial, as, as something hostile, etc. But it is a fait accompli to accommodate it. Uh, I think there's a younger generation uh, that uh, the Prime Minister and Crown Prince uh, MBS has grown up in, that is post-Oslo even. It's, it, it's post-PLO-Israel uh, di diplomacy and agreements. And I, I think what you end up with then is a, a new Arab generation that is more willing to see Jewish nationalism in Israel as another uh, nationalism in the Middle East. As you know, so there are all these different Arab nationalisms, and then you have uh, Persian nationalism in uh, Iran and Baluchi nationalism and Kurdish nationalism and Turkish nationalism and Jewish nationalism in Israel. It's not, it's just not, not, seen as that unusual. So it, in that sense, Israel and the Jewish national movement in Israel can be helpful on some things like mm -hmm. Iran and unhelpful on other things like Palestine and the occupation. And it, so there's just less of a of a traumatic and pathological attitude. It, you end up with the same policies, right, I think, but a different attitude. Yeah. It, could, I, could I enter? So I just yes. to expand upon this. Uh, there is no doubt a generational issue. And maybe that generational issue is then articulated in a different way. But the notion that uh, the old guard in Saudi Arabia, be it King Salman, be it King Fahad, viewed Israel in a pragmatic way was there. So he's not that different, not because he's, a, he's part of a new generation. This is what many people I think uh, haven't seen or looked enough into Saudi history is that they've actually viewed Israel far more pragmatically than many people thought they have. They've actually said, listen, cooperation in, in 
interests with Israel, economic interests and security interests is great, but let's arrange, find a solution to move forward. Now, if I was to take that statement now, uh, this would make headlines of saying how MBS is willing to, to, to be, you know, part of, you know, this is his new vision. But when you look at this, this was part of just after Desert Storm, when Saudi officials were saying this, when, you know, you, you don't, you see that there is this, this, this history of pragmatism towards Israel. Yeah. It's now, there in the RFP signature also. And the fourth, the Fahad, it, exactly. Uh, and the Fahad, Fahad plan that later turned into the uh, Fahad plan that later turned into the Fahad plan where they were recognizing this. So uh, exactly. So there is a history. Now, there are some mm. things that MBS does have to continue. I mean, a lot of times he's looking at this kind of nationalist as, you know, he, just forget about the past. But he's actually embracing the past. Some of it, not all of it. He's actually, you know, negotiating with the past, with the history of Saudi Arabia. And therefore, there's a lot of things, you know, Palestine, it, it's a question of which we don't have time when, uh, time, but what kind of role does the Palestinian issue play in Saudi nationalism, as, as uh, Hussein mentioned? And this is a different question, but this is, you know, part of a negotiated thing. Now, I think uh, there was another question about um, Saudi Iranian yeah, rapprochement very quickly. Yeah. Yeah, very quickly. Saudi now is, I think what Saudis are good at historically and what enabled them to maintain their legitimacy and their security is how Saudi Arabia know how to balance. They know how to balance positions and they know how to balance between different kind of, you know, they know how to balance between being in a rock and a hard place. They've always done this. And having relations with Iran, at the same time, potential relations with Israel is something that they're going to have to balance. And I believe in order for them to balance, there has to be something they have to build that legit, that relationship on, the, build the legitimacy of a Saudi-Israeli uh, relationship on, which is some sort of concession, some sort of that they, they could say, listen, there is something here that we could, we, you know, mm -hmm. that you can't criticize us too much for. Um, yeah. And that's, that's my, I, so I anticipate a balancing act. I so, see uh, them as actually, uh, I think they're fundamentally uh, unrelated. Let me just read the absolutely last question by another good, great friend from the United Arab Emirates, Hamd al Kindi, who asks about how can the U.S. balance uh, the uh, new relationship that develops between Saudi and Iran, and also it's uh, uh, joining BRICS, uh, if the uh, uh, normalization between Israel and Saudi Arabia uh, does not happen sooner. How can it manage and balance uh, the relationship? Mainly if Israel, you know, will be kind of left uh, alone. Uh, if you can, very, very briefly. I mean, I can very quickly. Look, you know, um, the, the, I don't think the U.S. needs to worry about uh, Iranian and Saudi relations, right? I mean, it's, it's, again, you know, we're going back to the pre-2016 era here. They go back and forth. What the U.S. doesn't want is a conflict between the two countries. And, and so far as they have relations, that's fine. It really is not a problem for, for Washington. Um, the, the BRICS issue is more complex because it has to do with the extent to which Saudi Arabia is moving uh, outside of the U.S. strategic framework or is going to stay firmly as a core charter member of the U.S. framework. And I think it's very clear for the reasons I said at the very beginning of this program that the U.S. now has a different conceptualization of why the uh, area surrounding Saudi Arabia and the Arabian Peninsula is so crucial to American global uh, security policy. Now, uh, I, I think they're to the point of willing to offer the Saudis something that heretofore was not really conceivable, which is a written security guarantee. Will they be able to get uh, the triangular buy-in that makes it work? Because without Israel, it doesn't work. It doesn't work in the Senate, and it doesn't create that network of integrated pro-American forces in the region. Uh, that's the open question. The inevitable triangle. Yeah. All right. Uh, time flies when you enjoy the conversation. I hope that all of our attendees uh, enjoyed uh, you know, our webinar and this conversation. On this occasion, I would like to thank very much our esteemed partners, the Arab uh, uh, Gulf State Institute in Washington uh, for all of the great work. I would like to thank our wonderful uh, panelists. Thank you very much, Nir, Aziz, and Hussein. 
Uh, and uh, we are looking forward uh, to host and to see you uh, and to talk to you in our future webinars. Uh, follow ropes.org. Follow, of course, the uh, website uh, and on social media, the Arab Gulf States uh, Institute in Washington. Uh, there is in the chat box all the information of the websites, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, you name it, you have it all now in the chat box. Uh, and with that, uh, I would like to wish you well, shalom, salam, and thank you very much for participation.